Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All righty. We were talking about our minds being deceived, and we finished up, you know, uh, we talked about you can be deceived by the devil. The devil blinded the minds by your own disobedience. We didn't really quite cover that. Look at James 1.22, and then we're going to move on down into uh, what the Word of God will do to for us. We want God's Word to do something for us. Amen. But uh, James 1.22, so we can be deceived by the devil. We can be deceived by our disobedience. Look here. Um, Verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, sozo your suke, but be doers of the word and not hearers only what? Deceiving your own selves. Notice you can deceive yourself. Now I'll be honest with you, the worst kind of deception is self-deception. It's harder to see it than anything else. See, you can almost take some, when somebody's deceived by another person, or, like, or by the devil, we can go to the Bible enough and say, here, 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 boom, 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 and they can begin to see it. <clears throat> if they're deceived by another person, you can point and start pointing stuff out, and they can, but when you deceive yourself, it's hard to point it out because it would be pride gets in there. You know, I'm never wrong. And uh, self-deception is a bad kind of deception. So um, if we're going to be, be spirit beings who are walking with God, and we, we are spirit beings, but if we're going to be living out of our spirit, living out of the new man, living in that whole new plane altogether, um, <clears throat> we're going to have to make sure that we're not just hearers of the word, but we are doers of the word. So there's a lot of people who go to church, yeah, man, I heard that. Oh, I've heard that. Well, I've heard that. I've heard that. And they go on talking about all the things they've heard, and they're not doing it. But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, I know a lot of people who go to every meeting of every preacher and every meeting they can get into and talk about what they heard and not doing any of it. Not making an application of it to their life. Just they heard it. And they're almost like the, the, the philosophers of Mars Hill where they're just constantly around trying to be, hear something new and hear something else and, hear, and, you know, and just get to talk about what they've heard and they get into that realm, well, I, yeah, I know, look, I heard this, 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 but they don't, they don't have it working in their life. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a Greek word used in the New Testament. Uh, now there, there, we all know that the word gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, means knowledge. But there's another word, epinosis, E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. And it doesn't just mean to, to have learn or heard something and, and you know that in other words well I saw two plus you know they said two plus two equals four so I know that but you don't you haven't experienced you haven't taken two building blocks with two more building blocks and counted them and you experienced it epinosis is the clear accurate precise and experiential knowledge and God wants us to come into the epinosis of him not just the gnosis but a, a clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of the things of God, of him, of his word, where we're, we've actually experienced these things and walked them out. Amen? And so we don't want to just have a gnosis. We want to have the epinosis. Somebody say glory to God. Now, you don't have to go around and tell everybody, I got the epinosis. We're just trying to give you the, the, the difference in the meaning of those words so you understand. God's after more than just... Um, an acknowledgement that you have seen or committed that to memory, you've experienced it. You've gone beyond that. You've experienced it. Amen. Gnosis would almost be like you're acquainted with somebody. You met them. Now, we, you know, we, could, we, we often see people and they say, oh, yeah, I know them. Well, well how well do you? Well, I met them one time. What they meant is they, they became acquainted or they were introduced. They know who they are. But they don't have an epinosis of that person. They don't know what they like to eat. They don't know what they like to drink. They don't know what, where they like to go. They don't know where they like to vacation. They don't know those things. They haven't, they haven't spent that time until it became an experiential knowledge of how that person is. God wants us to be that with him and his word. He wants us to go beyond, oh, yeah, I met God because I got saved. We want to go into a deeper place where we, we know what God desires out of us, what God wants out of us. God, uh, we want to have that fellowship with him. We want to know him in a, in a deeper 
sense of the word rather than just being acquainted or have been introduced. Okay? And the same thing is true with his word. But be, you know, be the word and not heroes only, deceiving whom? Your own self. So we want to move beyond only hearing the word. You don't just show up for a church sermon, hear a couple of scriptures, and walk out and say, Whoa, that was good today. You got to go apply some stuff. You got to go study it out. You got to make it part of your life, and you got to go apply it to your life for it to be beneficial. Having sat in faith in Victory Church, I, we've had people come into this church and die. Yeah. And just be honest with you. We've had people sit here for, for, and, and, and listen to the word, and listen to the word, and die. We had one person die in the church. Yeah. Well, I thought y'all had faith. You can't override when someone's not applying. There has to be an application of that word. Amen. To their own personal life. Now, what, have we, did we change what we preached? Nope. Kept right on preaching the same thing. Why? Because the next person will get it. We've got people who had supernatural miracles. I mean, beyond just the normal, I mean, supernatural manifestations of healing in our church. Amen. So we've got them. We, we as individuals, see, we become individually responsible. So number one, number one is, you know, this morning we said that you could be deceived by the devil. Tonight, you could be deceived by yourself. And third, you could be deceived by others. <clears throat> Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> and and if, that air can, if that heat is on, we don't need it. <laughs> okay, it's not. Okay, just making sure I hear, the, I hear a motor running. I'm thinking, dear Lord, we don't need any heat. <laughs> it's just... We're in that crazy time of year where it's, you know, a high of 38 one day and the high of 63 the next. And then the low will be, you know, 20 degrees higher than the high was a day before or something. You know, that's just, praise God for North Carolina. Particularly up here in the uh, uh, northern Piedmont uh, where we get the Appalachian Wedge. Hallelujah. That's a weather phenomenon we get here. And it just, oh boy. Low pressure comes in, banks the cold air up against the mountains. We get cold. Our loft is even warmer. It'll be 20 degrees warmer, 5,000 feet up. <laughs> you know, praise the Lord because the cold air sinks and, and then gets pushed in against the mountains. So we have some crazy weather. Don't want, all that to say, we don't want the heat. Here, look here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Listen to his next charge to him. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science so falsely so-called, which some, have, some professing have erred concerning the faith. See, there are people who will come and go, lead you astray. They'll lead you as people. Listen, there are, there are people under the guise of ministry that are leading people astray. Are you here? They're leading people astray. They're leading them into darkness. They're leading them into places they shouldn't go. And we do know that in some cases it's because of filthy lucre's sake. They're, they're out to get the money. Others, they're just deceived themselves. You know, people who deceive themselves don't mean to be leading people astray. They've gotten deceived. Which is why we always, let me say this. We always have to come back to the Word. And we, as individual Christians, have a responsibility to individually go back to the Word for ourselves. No matter what our favorite preacher says, no matter what our pastor says, no matter what anyone says, you have a responsibility to go back and, and study the Word out for yourself. Now, I was just, I was meditating along these lines on the way over tonight, and I got to thinking about how that we like to do systematic theology. And I, I, I like this systematic theology. That is, study the subject of faith. Study the subject of healing. Study the subject of, you know, uh, end times. Study different subjects, and you go through the Bible, and you get all the scriptures. That's, that's referred to as systematic theology, okay? And systematic theology is a, is, is a legitimate and good way to study the Bible. But you cannot only study your Bible systematically. You have to study it um, in, in an expository manner and do exegesis, that is to study things as the whole. You know, the whole book of Romans and the whole book of this and the whole book of that. And balance the two against each other. Because you may take a scripture out that fits your systematic theology, but put back into its context of the whole doesn't line up with what you're interpreting it as. So when we take both and we compare them and we weigh them against each other, then we get a better view of things. Amen. And I think it's, I think it's, it's an, uh, imperative upon each one of us that we take the time to study things out both ways so that we're, not, that we're not interpreting things in the wrong way. 
So you can get out of balance. Now, you, people think all that Dad Hagen ever taught was faith. That's not true. But that's, you know, that's all he ever talked about was faith. And <clears throat> remember, you hear him say this. Well, I've read the, Bible, the New Testament through over 150 times and parts of it more than that. So he did, he did complete studies. He taught faith because God mandated him to go teach my people faith. Well, so that means you just can't listen to Brother Hagin as your only source of teaching. Because his mandate was to teach faith. That was his primary ministry. You need to get the, you need to get the other things. Like how, how to treat your wife. Hello? How to raise your children. How to walk in Christian character. There are other subjects of the Bible that we need to cover and have that as a whole. And, and then study books as a whole, which we're doing with the life and writings of Paul on Wednesday nights. We need to be able to do that. So, um, so that we don't get led astray. And I said that because some ministers have just gotten led astray because they just, they got caught up on one little thing and didn't let that go. And that's the only thing they did. And they were just, that, 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 boom, 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 boom. That's great if that's your mandate to teach it. But as an individual, they had to study the whole. Why? Because they study to show yourself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, Paul wrote to Timothy. You need to make sure that you're, that you're balanced, and I'm not talking about compromise, I'm not talking about a little faith and a little doubt. <clears throat> or a little faith and a little unbelief. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about making sure that what, what, what you're getting out of maybe a systematic study is born up, bears up under an expository study. Also, that, that same teaching would, would stand up under that as you study the whole. Y'all with me? I'll go home. All right. Can I get an amen from Brother Bill? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Bill's got the deep amen voice. Okay. So our minds can be deceived by others. He said, Paul wrote and told Timothy, watch out. Don't, just avoid those people. Yeah. Avoid those vain and profane babblings. And oppositions of science, so false, false or so-called, which some having professed have erred concerning the faith. We don't want to be in error. So what does that mean? When you hear something, and it may sound wonderful. It's just like I said this morning. People get on Facebook and they make these grandiose de declarations. There's one minister that does it all the time. I mean, you think, my God, let me loose at the world after that declaration. I ain't, there ain't going to be a devil within 100 miles. Now they just all shut up on your front doorstep. Fight, you've got to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to exercise your authority. You've got to walk according to the word of God. You've got to deal with those devils. You've got to, you know, we got to wrestle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Jesus did not say, you know, if we could just get rid of all the devils, Jesus would have said, you know, that um, all of the devils out there, the principalities, powers, mice, dominions, and rulers of the darkness of the world, I've taken care of them. You don't have anything to deal with. That's not what he said. You know, that's not what the Bible says. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mights, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And we're told to use our authority. Right. You just can't go declare them all gone. There ain't no one out there. See, those kind of things are things that, that really are, are vain babblings because they're not scripturally accurate. And it puts people in the mindset or the belief that they don't have any problems. Yeah. And they're not going to have to deal with anything. And they'll go out there, whoa, I ain't got nothing to deal with. I mean, sister so-and-so declared on Facebook this morning. Well, la di ba -di. I couldn't think of a good thing. You know, I couldn't think of some, oh, I can't think of my old country sayings. And I don't give doodly squat. There you go. Old doodly squat, Yeah. And for those kind of things. Why? Because they're not, they're, they're, they are a deception. The truth is there are spiritual forces arrayed against you and you are warned and admonished by the word of God to put on the whole armor of God that you can stand when that stuff comes against you. Paul even called it the evil day. Stuff's going to come against you. And he tells you what to do to be equipped. And it's not declare over everybody in the body of Christ they're not going to have any trouble. Is to equip for a fight. That's right. That's right. So to say something other than what the word says is a vain babbling. And can bring deception to the body. So we need to do what? We need to stay with the word of God. Man, I, I would love if I could just go home tonight and say, well, praise God, I declare there's no devil in hell, no demon in heaven. I mean, no, no demon in the atmosphere. No, no devil himself can mess with me ever again. As a matter of fact, I bind you and cast you into the pit. And I... 
We got people trying to cast the devil into the pit. Jesus didn't even do it. Have, all, have you come to torment us before the time? Now, there'll be a day, and we're all going to get to watch it, and we'll all stand there and go, is this he who caused the nations to tremble? So it's a coming day without everybody's going to be there, and it's not going to be because you got up and Facebooked it. I'm just tired of stupid stuff. Why? It brings a deception to the thinking of people, and instead of them telling them, listen, we, we, we are, there's a spiritual war out there. Put on the armor of God. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to tremble. You don't have to be shaking in your house about going out into the world because the devil's out there. No, put on the whole armor of God. Get yourself equipped. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Get filled up with the word and go out there and do battle. Amen. <laughs> don't go picking a fight, but when he shows up, you're ready for it. Amen. So you don't get deceived. Stay with the word. All right. So that's the third way. You know, if you, and you cannot live the way you're supposed to live if you're going to be living on dumb stuff. Amen. That's like getting up and telling your kids, get up. It's time for school, but you don't have to go. You've already got an A in everything in Jesus' name. You don't have to study. You don't have to do the homework. You don't have to take the test. I declare you have an A in Jesus' name. It don't work that way. I said it doesn't work that way. All right. So <clears throat> what do we do? We, we start with the word of God. It is the basis of our growth in him. Remember, Peter said receive, uh, that um, um, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He also said, Peter said this. He said, um, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby now Paul did write to the church the Hebrew church and say you should have been teachers you be your own milk when you should be on meat so you're supposed to grow past the milk we're supposed to get into the depth of the word see I think milk is things like you know um, you got goosebumps in church today that's kind of you know whoo you know Holy Ghost cave and I got goosebumps well I thank God for the Holy Ghost and I thank God for the experiences we have in the Holy Ghost. But you've got to grow so that if you don't have a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, you still can stand. Because he's not going to always manifest the way you think he is. He'll do things for you as a baby that he's not going to do for you as an adult. Not on a regular basis. Because you've got to learn to live off the word. Amen? Amen? So you can be teaching others how to win and how to live. John 17, 17. <clears throat> we need to let the word of God sanctify us, our souls. You know, let's, let's get over here. My Bible page, this, this new Bible that y'all got me, or somebody got me, you've got me, I think. The pages are so thin, I mean, I can, turn, I can grab one set of pages and go through seven books. <laughs> so I'm still getting used to that. <laughs> Hallelujah. My other Bible had a little bit thicker pages. You, you only went through six books. Anyway, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We have to, now, now, sanctify is a term that means to separate. When you're sanctified, you're separated from something. What are we separated from? We're separated from the world and worldly ways under God and God's ways. Jesus said that the word is truth and that truth will separate us from the things of the world. Again, I go back to my um, statements this morning. Why are we trying so hard? To be like the world when the word is trying to separate us from the world. Well, I can win more people that way. Please give me scripture. And I don't mean some isolated, some, I mean a body of scripture that will support that position. Because every time the disciples got in trouble and every time something went on during the book of Acts that was, that, was, that was coming against them, they went to their own company. Then when they got filled up again with the Holy Ghost, when they got back on track, they went back out to the world to preach to the world. They weren't living like the world. 
Hello. The Word of God. See, we got to let the Word of God sanctify the way we think. Remember, James says, receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we've already talked about this. You know, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Separate them from what? From the way they used to live. From the way they used to think. From the way they used to do this. From the way they did before. And what was it before? It was flesh ruled. They had a carnal mind. And Paul wrote and said that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither in, it's an, it's an enmity against God, and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So there has to be a change or a separating of the carnal mind and the transformation into the spiritual mind. How? By truth. Well, what's truth? God's word. Jesus said so. Amen. And so when we get, when the word of God begins, understand this, when you get born again, you're born again. Your spirit's a new man. All things are of God. Well, not, your mind didn't get saved because Romans tells us we got to do something about our mind. Your body didn't get saved because Ephesians says we got a promise of a, glor a future glorification of the body. To wit, the redemption of our body in Ephesians chapter 1. So what is, see, the new man is born again. The old, the old fleshly desires still want to rule. The new man wants to rule. How do you get it to work? You get your soul separated. You get your mind renewed. Paul tells us that we cannot be conformed to the world, and the way we break out of being conformed to the world is the transforming or the um, metamorphosis of our mind, of our soul. There's a, there is an absolute transformation of how we think. And Jesus said that separation comes from truth, and truth is God's word. So we, begin, we have to begin to let the word of God show us things and direct us in things and teach us things <clears throat> that we have not walked in here too for before you got saved, that you didn't know before you got saved. You couldn't know before you got saved because your mind couldn't be renewed until you got saved. So the mind has been trained to analyze things and feed it to the flesh. Now remember, or interpret, the, 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 you know, the, the, to interpret by the senses what reality is. You remember your mind would determine reality by what the senses, the flesh, sent to it. What you see, what you hear, what you taste, what you touch. Amen? Did I get them all? Did I leave one out? Huh? Smell. Left out smell. Thank you, Karen. Left out smell. And so your whole life, you've been trained that whatever, the, whatever impulses the body sends to the mind is reality. But now, the Word of God teaches us that His Word is reality, truth, reality. And that the mind now has to accept reality as what God's Word says and not what's coming out of your senses. That's a whole new transformation of how you act and function. That's a complete change in how you function. See, your body says, I'm sick. Your mind, the, the word of God says that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. <clears throat> and so what you have to do, instead of, instead of letting the, the senses of your body tell your mind that you're sick, you have to allow the word of God to tell your, tell your mind that you're healed. And now act on the higher reality of what God said. That's, that's new. Because people, people say, I won't believe it until I see it then it's not faith. If you have to see it to believe it, then it's not faith. It's, it's carnality. It's, your it's the senses of your body determining what you think is reality. When God's word, I'm not trying to get weird, or, you know, real philosophical or whatever, but we're talking about a higher law. We're talking about spiritual things. And the higher reality is the spirit realm. Thus, God said, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. The renewing of the mind gives you God's perspective on the circumstance or the situation. And you are, you, by transforming that mind, by sanctifying it through the word of God and separating it, not being conformed to the world, being transformed, having metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. Amen. 
you're now able to tap into the realm of the spirit and live out of that spirit realm and it adjusts and change the natural realm. Remember, look over 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And this isn't goobity gawk. God is spirit. The spirit realm carries a higher authority than the natural realm. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You've heard, this, you've heard this scripture before, I'm sure. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now the word temporal means simply subject to change. Spiritual things, God's law, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. How long? Forever. So it don't change. Now I know people try to change. Well, it wasn't relevant like it is. You know, it was, maybe it was relevant 2,000 years ago, but it's not relevant today. I got news for you. Stop, just stop talking that stupid relevant stuff. God's word is an unchanging. Listen, gravity is just as relevant now as it was the day the earth was created. It didn't change. It's still a law. It's still working. Well, you know, I mean, you know, 2,000 years ago, gravity was relevant, but it's not relevant today. You know, we can fly, not without gravity. If you really study it, we, we do say the law of thrust and lift supersedes the law of gravity. Actually, it, it still uses gravity. Gravity is still in operation, and so the law of thrust and lift works with gravity to allow you to fly. But it, I'm going to tell you something. If the engines get turned off, you come back down. And if gravity turns off, you float out in outer space. Hello. So, you know, gravity is still relevant. Yeah. And since the spiritual realm is a higher order and the eternal order of all things, then the spirit realm, the things of God are still relevant. They did not lose their relevancy because we got some, some people who got some new ideas. God's not real. God's not cool. You know, the Bible is but just a bunch of fairy tales put together. They even call on, you know, Mo, this new movie Exodus, and I, I wouldn't even bother going to see it. You're going to waste your money. It is so unscriptural. It's not even close. Then they're saying that, you know, uh, that the, the guy gave a more, um, a more realistic interpretation of what happened with the Red Sea, you know. It just happened that, you know, there was an earthquake and tornadoes and all this kind of stuff, and it split back, and it just happened that when the Egyptians got out there, they got drowned. You know, not that God split the Red Sea. Because they want to, see, they're, they're, these movies are, the last one, Noah. It was unscriptural. Hollywood's now trying to make Bible epics unbiblical. Yeah. So don't waste your money. And just tell people, you know, people you know, don't bother. It ain't even close. Well, the special effects are cool. I'd rather go see a movie I knew was not, of, you know, Star Wars. I'm not going to get the force mixed up with God. Okay? Then you go see something that pretends to be given the account of the Bible and lying the whole, all the way through, the sword fights going through. Moses says, stand ye still, see the salvation of God. He didn't say, get your swords out. Where was it? Oh, higher, the spirit realm is a higher order. Thus, when we renew our mind to the word of God and sanctify our souls and we begin to think in line with what the Bible says, then we're able to function and live on that whole new plane altogether. And we're able to look into that realm and allow that to affect our thinking so that we're, now our mind is hooking up with our spirit and the realities that we're getting coming out of the word of God and not out of our senses. And we're not denying what's going on. We're just superseding it with a higher order. Sickness has attacked your body, but the word of God says Jesus is our healer. Jesus you know, whose own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Now, somebody will come along and say that means spiritual healing or that was for the Jews. Go read your Bible. Isaiah 55, uh, 53 and Matthew 8, 16 and 17. Put all that together. It all means it was physical healing. 
You, you can't interpret it any other way. If you are, you're just, you're just trying to make it fit your theology. And, and, and it won't work. You have to just, you'll have to mess with a whole bunch of stuff to make it work. And then while you're doing that, you're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself then. We well, you know this 103rd Psalm says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name and forget not his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine. I'm, it's amazing how many people believe he'll forgive you all your iniquities and leave off the last half of that verse. Who healeth all thy diseases. Thy word. Amen. It's life to those that find it. And health. Now the King James says health, but the, but the literal Hebrew says medicine to all thy flesh. How, how can it be medicine? See, God's word operates from a higher order. Now, God spoke everything into existence. God created the matter. He created the natural realm from outside that natural realm. Amen. He knows how to fix it. See, spiritual laws supersede natural laws. That's why Jesus could walk on water. That's why the axe head could float. That's why God could split the Red Sea. He could call hell to fall out of heaven and burn on the ground like fire. He could, consume a he could burn a bush but not consume the bush. Glory to God. Are you here? Because the spiritual realm, the laws of the spirit operate on a higher plane than the natural laws. And that's why we as spirit beings living in this flesh body now, if you're not born again, you're still a spirit being. If you don't accept Jesus, you'll go to hell. And your spirit will exist forever in, in torment. That's just the way it is. So, you know, not just not Christians aren't the only ones who are spirit beings. Everyone's a spirit being. That's the way God chose to design it. Why? I don't know. Well, if you don't know why, then, you know, how, well, it doesn't matter whether I know why he did it. He did it. It's like saying the just should live by faith. Why we got to live by faith? Because God said so. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, I don't want to live by faith. Go ahead and be dumb, dummy. Yeah. Go ahead and live by your senses. You're going to have a tough road to hoe. Anybody know what that means? Yeah. If you're old country folk, you know what a tough road to hoe means. Now, Janie's uh, uncle had, uh, actually it was her great uncle, and uh, he, he would have a garden that he used a tractor to till. Now, when you pull out a tractor to go till your garden, you know that's a long road. Whenever they went one time to pick potatoes, uh, to, to get potatoes, pick potatoes, whatever you call it. I don't remember what you call it, dig potatoes. And you look down that road, and you thought, my God, I've seen tobacco roads shorter than that. And you, got, you, know, you, and you, have to go, you used to have to go out in, in the old days, go out there with a, with a hoe, a garden hoe, and get all the grass and all the weeds out as they're trying to come up and choke off the, the crops. And so you look down that road, you got a tough road to hoe. And the, the God, I can't even see the other end. Our Dorothy's down there with the rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's way on down there. If you're going to live out of your flesh, you got a tough road to hoe. <coughs> You can live out of your spirit and live in, live in, in the things of God and live in the, in the tranquility of God and the peace of God. Can you say glory? Can you say hallelujah? So, look at Psalm 119, verse 130. See, the word of God will enlighten us. Everybody say enlighten me. And what it will enlighten you to is how God sees things. Can I say something? You already know how you see it. That's easy. You have already got. You already see how you see it. What you need is to change your perspective so you see how God sees it. Psalm 130 says, The interest of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding. I, like, I always like this verse, unto the simple. That means you don't have to have a PhD to get it figured out. Glory to God. Amen? I mean, you could, you could graduate in fourth grade and you still get it. Amen. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Now, light, symbolically or figuratively, is, is um, representative of revelation or illumination or understanding of something. Okay? 
So, you know, the interest of that word, give with light, it gives, it gives illumination on things. And it gives understanding to the simple. Even people who, don't, who can't figure out other stuff, God's word, will, God's word will bring understanding to them. Somebody say glory. Hallelujah. Praise God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. It's Paul's prayer to the church at Ephesus. Probably the church at large. We, you know, it's, it's highly likely that both Galatians and Ephesians were circular letters to the churches, you know, to the churches in the area at that time. And they may have just said, you know, to the church at Ephesus, and then they, they took that out and wrote to the church at Galatia and the church at Laodicea and that different thing. Likely, but we don't, since we had the one from Ephesus, we'll just say it's to the Ephesians. But it's, how, it's a general, what we call a general epistle. Okay. There are certain, now, the church at Rome, the, to the church at Rome was a church, writ, a letter written specific to, specifically to the, to the things at Rome, church at Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, but we believe these, well, these are general epistles, and they, and they didn't deal with, if you'll notice, they deal more, like, more with doctrine and positional truths than they do with es issues in the church. Yeah. See, Corinthians was dealing with correction, 2nd Corinthians was dealing with correction, uh, Romans had stuff in it. But these are what we refer to a general, more, more weight is on general doctrine in the church. Okay? So Paul says, he prayed, and I believe he prayed, he didn't pray just, just for the Ephesians, he prayed for everybody. Amen? For this cause I bow my knee. Amen? Where, where, he sees not to make mention of you my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. Now, some interesting things here. Now, verse 17, that the God of the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the epinosis of him. God wants you to have a clear, precise, accurate, and uh, experiential knowledge of him. The eyes, this word doesn't, doesn't mean these, it means the, your vision, to see. And we understand what, a lot of times we're talking about uh, that when, we, when something opens up to us, when we comprehend it, we see it. This is talking about that the vision of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope. Now, this word know does not mean epinosis. It means that you may see you may see what is the hope of his calling. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God's word opens your eyes, your spiritual eyes. Remember Jesus said this when he's talking about some things. He said, he that have ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Now folks, he won't talk about these things on the side of your head. And that's not what he's talking about. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit. He's talking about spiritually hearing. He's talking about hearing with understanding. Amen. Amen. Somebody out there, y'all out here, go home. He's talking about hearing with spiritual understanding. You know, you hear what the spirit says. You're not, you're beyond just the, the, the sheer words. You are actually hearing what the spirit's saying. With an understanding of spiritual things. He's talking about the same thing here with your eyes. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. That they would see. That you would be able to view from the spiritual side what it means. God wants you to view from the spiritual side what it means. And I sure wish you would stop trying to figure out how you can get away with stuff. And see the things God wants. To. What, what God has for us is so much greater. I'm telling you more and more. You need to go back and listen to what I pre preached back in January on uh, Egypt, just saying all that. They came out of Egypt. They got to a certain place. They couldn't see where God was leading them. They couldn't, you know, the, the, the journey they took should have taken them two weeks. It took them 40 years. Why? Because they couldn't see what God was seeing. All they could see was out there, out here, and they don't know where they're going. And then they began to think back with their carnal self. And say, would to God we were in Egypt because we had food there. They wanted to go back to Egypt. Now, for 400 years, they were on the wine and cheese crowd. And it wasn't the uh, red or 
white wine. It was W-H-I-N-E wine, complaining crowd. 400 years they complain. Then God brings them out, and then they start whining, which they could go back. See, see when you begin, see, and I'm going to tell you, Christians do the same thing. They come out of bondage. They come out of captivity, and they get to a certain place down the road, and they're not seeing it the way God sees it, and they're ready to go back to the way it was before because they have experienced that. And the unknown is fearful to them. So they're not in faith. They're not seeing it the way God sees it. You have to renew your mind to the way God sees things. <clears throat> and you have to let that renewal take place in your mind. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stop shaking at me. How many of you when you put your little password in it? It ain't right. That would be a $600 mistake. All right. Wouldn't it? The word of God will change us from glory to glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Back up over there. We're going to wrap up right about here. Is that all right with y'all? Not all right with y'all? You going to wrap up somewhere else? <laughs> Verse 17 says, Now the, the Lord is that spirit. He's been talking about some different things. We're not going to go back and read all that. But, um, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, praise God for that. But then Paul goes on another place and says, don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. God wants us free. But he doesn't want us free to use that liberty to give an occasion to your flesh. So stop teaching stupid stuff. Yeah, we're free. We're free to obey God. We're free to live out of our spirits. We're free to walk the way God designed us to walk. We're not free to give occasion to the flesh. And it'd be okay with God. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, as we get into the Word of God and spend time with God, and we, the more we get into the Word, the more we will live out of our spirit. The more our mind is renewed or, or transformed. Remember, Paul wrote to the church at Rome and said, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the more you break away from world conformity means you're being more and more conformed to God's world or God's kingdom. And the more you do that, the more the Spirit of God's working at work in you, putting those, and you're putting those things into operation. And the more you go from glory to glory. Yeah. Now, whatever glory you've tasted, there's more. Amen. Amen. I don't care what plane you're on, where you are on, on the highway, where you are on your walk with the Lord in comparison to somebody else. Wherever, whatever glory you've tasted, there's more. You haven't come close to experiencing the fullness of the glory of the Lord. Moses got into the presence of it and his face started shining. Remember, he just, and really, the Lord wouldn't let him see, uh, uh, see anything but the backside. Couldn't deal with it. Face shone so bright they had to put a cover over his face just from being in the, and there's more glory than that. Jesus, Jesus let a little bit out up there on the Mount of Transfiguration and it changed the color of his clothes. His raiment became bright and shiny as a noonday sun. I'm telling you, we haven't seen anything close to what God has. And, and, people, and people want to figure out how they can live more in the flesh. We need to be figuring out how we can live more in the presence of God and more in the spirit, more in the word, more like God wants us to live. Because there's something over there that's way beyond anything you'll ever experience here. Now, I'm a Panther fan. Turned the TV off today. I just turned it off. Didn't get to start the second half, but I turned on the second half. They were down 28 to 6. I thought, oh, brother. Then went out and scored on the first drive and got 20 to 13. Oh, maybe they're going to get in there. 31 to 13. Somewhere in there, I just said, forget it, turn it off. You know, I'm not going to live, you know, it's just, you know, I enjoy it, but I'm not going to just, you know, pound my brains out there just watching it. There's things that are, that are higher. You know, last year they were 12 and 4 and went to the playoffs. This year they're 3, 8, and 1. They ain't going nowhere but home. And need to go somewhere for training camp over the winter. They're pitiful. The whole NFC South is pitiful. Now, here's the funny thing. If they run the gamut and New Orleans and um, 
Atlanta lose one more game besides losing to Carolina, they could win the NFC South at 7-8-1. and one. That's pitiful. There's no glory in that. And I enjoy, I enjoy you know, uh, Carolina lost to Butler the other day. I, I ain't going to watch them. It's like, why bother? There's, there's more things more, of more value than wasting all that time on that. There's nothing wrong watching a football game. I, you know, I watch them. Jamie watching the pan- I watched the Raiders the other day when they beat Kansas City because, you know, anybody see my post? Turn on the TV, and Oakland was beating Kansas City 23-7 to or something, and I posted. I turned the TV on and must have experienced a disruption in the time-space continuum in a wormhole back to the 70s because Oakland's beating Kansas City. They were 0-10 at the time. <laughs> and 0-16 over their last games, but they won that game. <coughs> All the things this world has to offer. All the pleasures this world has to offer. I like going on a cruise, going snorkeling, eating all the food. Eat ba 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 glory to God. But none of that compares to the glory of God. There's nothing I did before I got saved that's of, the, of equal or even close to being of equal pleasure and value and of importance as being in the presence of God and being changed from glory to glory. There are things with God that you'll never be able to experience in the natural that you can only experience in God. And we should be telling people that instead of, well, you can get away with this, still get to heaven. Hello? Now, Dad Hagen, somebody came to Dad Hagen one time and said, Brother Hagen, I would get saved, but I like to dance. Well, he said, well, go ahead and get saved. You can dance all you want to. See, he, he wasn't condoning dancing. He said, go ahead and get saved. You can dance all you want to. They came back to him about a week later and said, I see what you mean. He said, what? He said, ever since I got saved, I want to. is gone. We got churches trying to convince people that it's okay to do whatever they want to do and not get them saved. You know, God loves you no matter what you're doing. That's not what he said. He said, go ahead and get saved. And you can dance all you want to. Because he knew if they, if they had a real encounter with the Lord, they're going to want to get away from the things that brought them pleasure before and, be, and let the Lord bring them pleasure. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, let's, let's quit here. We'll pick up next Sunday. Wednesday night, we're still teaching in Romans. Praise the Lord. We're getting close to in the Romans, though. I believe we'll get it done by the end of the year. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.